Greetings all, Dr. Levi Garrett here on behalf of Santa Ana College. We're gonna take some time today to walk through a lecture titled Fitness for the Ages. Now, the goal here is for this to be an interactive lecture, but obviously you're watching this online or streaming, uh, so we're not gonna be able to achieve that fully since we're not here live. However, I'm gonna be posing some questions throughout this presentation that I would encourage you to ask yourself as we work through. Uh, I'm gonna be speaking in generalities here. We've been with 30 different apartments and each one is a little bit different. Some have a small crew, some have a large crew, uh, depending on proximity, close to the beach, more inland, all of these variables are going to affect the needs of each of the departments. So I'm gonna be speaking on behalf of the information that I've gathered over the last 10 years of being here with Santa Ana. That said, if you guys ever have any questions, feel free to reach out. I'll have my contact information available for you guys. Um, we're gonna be providing a couple additional resources for you as well, and if you ever need clarity on those, I'm more than happy to help out there. So let's go ahead and jump into this real quick. The objectives today are going to be to identify current fitness routines, determine the life cycle of a firefighter, discuss training exercise variables, review training principles, examine resistance and cardiovascular training protocols, and we're also going to actually create a training protocol together today and go over that and talk about the why of what we're doing. So let's go ahead and jump in. Before we get to the actual meat of this presentation, we first need to do a fitness check, okay? What do I mean by that? Well, this is where the question asking begins. What is your current training routine? Do you train on duty? Do you train off duty? Do you train solo or do you train with a crew? It's important to what you would call maybe know thyself. You need to know what your needs are. What is going to be the best way for you to be as active as possible and training as smart as possible? I got some buddies that you have to save them from themselves. He's gonna get up at 5 a.m. every single day and get after it in the gym, whether he's tired or not. And that's commendable to be sure. But for a population such as yourselves, you guys are dealing with all kinds of disturbed and disrupted sleep. So maybe that's a day that you need to take off. So I talk about this know thyself. You might be someone that is again, a hard charger. And then you also might be someone that kind of needs a little bit of motivation. And so based on those things, you need to plan accordingly as you go through that. Uh, next is what style of training do you like? Are you a strength guy? Do you like to do cardio? Are you into high intensity interval training? Uh, are you in it to, you know, are you into calisthenics where you're just doing body weight exercises? Are you a kettlebell person? Whatever you may be, you need to ask yourself, what style of training do you get into? And then also leading into why do you train like this? What is the purpose? Is it for job performance, for general health? Maybe it's for aesthetics or maybe a little bit of all the above. So kind of know your why and that will help shape uh, maybe refining some of the training that you're doing and then also helping to fill some of the gaps because I know I have my preferences. I don't like burpees, so I don't put them in the training, but that doesn't mean that it's a terrible exercise to utilize as a tool to improve conditioning. So know what you like, but then also know what you don't like and figure out how can I kind of mix some of that into my training because it's probably leading to a gap, all right? And then lastly, how has your training changed over the years from being a new recruit all the way to kind of your terminal position or this, this last job title that you have before you retire? How have those things changed? How has your programming, how has your exercise, how has your health changed throughout the lifespan or this life cycle of your career in firefighting? And speaking of the life cycle of a firefighter, and, and I guess I could even zoom out a little bit further and say this is probably generalizable to military personnel, police officers, so just the tactical community in general. But we're gonna talk specific about firefighters today. So ask yourself, what is it like as a new recruit versus the position that you'll retire in? We can all agree that, again, a new recruit is gonna have different demands, different stresses, different requirements than an engineer, than a captain, than a chief. And not that any one position is easier than the other, but they're all gonna be different. We'll also notice that as you move through the lifespan of any tactical profession, in general, you're likely to reduce the amount of physical activity required in the job. So keep that in mind as we, as we kind of work through this. Also ask, how have job requirements or expectations changed? 
When you promoted, again, what happened when you were a new recruit and then you promoted to an engineer, were you more active, less active? Was it more physically demanding or less physically demanding? Similarly, are you at a busy station or not? Are you at one that you can kick your boots up or are you at one that you are called five, six, seven, eight times after 10 p.m.? That's another consideration as we are thinking about our training, how we can train, and then also how to build that type of programming. Next, are you at a new station? Did you just transfer from one of those busy stations to a slow one or from a slow one to a busy one? Maybe you lateraled. Maybe you went from a department that is super small now to a super big department where, again, the call volume and call frequency is different. So these are things that you're going to have to evaluate and adapt to accordingly. Lastly, age, your duration of service. How have things changed? Did you get in the game at 45 or did you get in the game at 25? So our bodies are obviously gonna be in different stages at those times and we can do our best to train to stay as healthy as possible. But that's another consideration as we look at the life cycle of a firefighter. Again, I can't assume your specific experience, but I want you guys to ask these questions and think about how have things changed over the years. I know for me as an outsider, I looked at the numbers and it was alarming to say the least. So we see a, a table here on the right with a few long lines and a few short lines. So what we're seeing here is the shift in four variables, fire related calls, medical aid, false alarm, and then subsequently total calls. This information comes from the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association, and these are current as of 2021, okay? So what I did here is I took the average of calls from 1980 to 89, 90 to 99, and so on. I took the average calls for fire, medical aid, false alarms, and total for the 80s, 90s, 2000, 2010, and then as recently as 2020. And you'll see here that some lines are going up and getting bigger, and some are getting smaller. What was most interesting to me is that the fire-related calls have been cut in half, and many will suggest that that's due to new technology, uh, fire prevention, and just knowledge of how to avoid fires, right? Uh, the sprinkler systems in new house builds are much different than that of the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. So fire-related calls have cut in half in the last 40 years. However, medical aids have more than quadrupled. Medical aids went from 6 million to approximately 24 million. So, and Y'all are firefighters, you already know this. This is no surprise to you, but the fire-related calls are going down. The medical aid is increasing. Now, what does that mean to an outsider? For me, I see fire as a very uh, cardiovascularly taxing demand on the body. You guys have to be in great shape to be able to fight fire. You have to sustain this over a period of time as well. But those calls are starting to go down and medical aid is starting to go up. So how do we adapt our training to accommodate for some of these shifts? Similarly, and I put this in here as well, the false alarms have increased almost threefold. And what's interesting about that to me is these are, this is disturbed sleep, disrupted sleep. So whether you're going on a call or not, not only have your medical aids increased where you have to go on those calls, but now your false alarms have also increased. And all of these are gonna play a factor in your sleep. Now, why is that important? Your ability to recover from the training the day of or the day before, but also it begs the question, should I even train today? If you were up, again, as I mentioned earlier, six times after 10 p.m., maybe that next day you don't need to train, but rather sleep. Now, I know that there is uh, some cultural challenges with that perhaps, uh, but I see a shift there. I see the value in health uh, over just, hey, we'll sleep when we're dead, right? That's a, an old term, and, and to some it works, I'm sure. Uh, but in general, if you want a long, healthy career, we need to be mindful and pick and choose when we're kind of pushing it, because you're already pushed at your job. So to add additional stress in something that should be helping us, which is exercise, but that's compounding some of the stress that we have from our normal job, from life, and so on, it might not be the best thing to train that next day. Now, those of you that are the ones that need the motivation that I talked about earlier, then we need to find a happy balance. Again, that doesn't mean that you should be trading after a crazy night, but we, that shouldn't be your excuse to not train at all. And then finally, of course, as the fire-related calls, which represented essentially the least amount of calls, have gone down, our, the total calls have gone up. And there's other variables that are included in these statistics. But in general, what I want you guys to see is something that you already know, which is a reduction in fire-related calls, an increase in medical aid, and an increase in false alarms, which subsequently, again, is an increase in total call volume. 
which is again, something that you need to consider as you build out your training and commit to some of those training days. Additional variables to consider, and we touched on a few of these, which are stress, sleep, nutrition, exercise, some health considerations. We, hear some, uh, we see some more data from the NFPA here. 54% of deaths are caused by overexertion, stress, and medical. Sound like your job? For sure. Uh, next, 46% of deaths come from sudden cardiac arrest. Okay, Again, most likely due to stress, but our heart is a muscle. We can train our muscle and make sure that it's in the best possible shape to be able to handle the stresses that we're placing on it. Now, I'm not gonna go through and, and in depth of each one of these bullet points here, but uh, this is also something that I want you to reflect back on. What was your stress like as a new recruit? You're nervous, you wanna get this job, this is a livelihood of your family. Uh, you know, you got folks who have gone before you that are putting you through the ringer to challenge you, to test you, to make sure that you can handle this profession. Uh, we have sleep, how has your sleep changed? Did it change when you got married? What about when you had a kid? What about you know, later in your career, you're a firefighter on the back half of your career and you're still getting up multiple times a night, right? Next is nutrition. Now this is another shift in the culture that I've seen. It was hot and a lot and meat and potatoes to now we're mixing in a few other types of vegetables and we're trying to be more mindful and cognizant. Furthermore, nutrition is another area that we can help our heart, okay? That's another way, in addition to exercise, that we can help make sure that we are as healthy and as safe as possible. Um, exercise, which we'll touch on more. Injury, what has injuries done to you over the years? Um, and that should also be a variable in your training. Do you have this nagging shoulder injury or is your back messed up? Well, those are the areas that we need to address. Oftentimes, when we have an injury, we go, oh, okay, I don't want to use that anymore because I don't want to hurt it again but how are we gonna be able to get it stronger if we never train it? Again, this is the disclaimer. I'm not saying, hey, you hurt your back, let's go 1RM our deadlift today. That's not what I'm saying, but we do need to strengthen our back because at the end of the day, you still got kids to pick up, yard work to do, and more importantly on the job, people to pick up, objects to pick up. So we need to make sure that we are maintaining healthy joints and the surrounding musculature around that to, to achieve that. Um, Next, let's talk about work-life balance. And we're not gonna go deep into this, but I guess this is also alluding to kind of the psychological component to all this. It's not just physical. We can all wake up, exercise, go to bed, or wake up, do our job, and go to sleep. But there's also a mental component that is, need to be considered here. We're not gonna go down that road, but I want you to ask yourself, how is your work-life balance? Is it adding stress or is it reducing stress? To be sure, we're gonna be going through seasons of time, as I mentioned, young kids, that's gonna be a season of a little bit more stress, understandably so, but once you move out of that, are you still allowing that stress to pile on or are you now coming up with new strategies to avoid some of the stress? Or even while you're in that season, are you doing your best to avoid the high stress outside of your job? Because it already has enough of that for you. Last couple things here, how do these things above change during each stage of your career? Being a rookie, medic, engineer, captain, chief, and even, something to consider here as we talk about fitness for the ages in the life cycle of a firefighter into retirement. Are you taking all of this stuff into retirement? I hope not. Retirement is the opportunity for us to eliminate or alleviate some of the stress, get a little bit more sleep, have some time to prep some meals and eat healthy and educate yourself about those things. So uh, keep that in mind and, and ask yourself, as you've moved through this career, how have things changed? But something that's more important here, those of you that are the sage, wise firefighters that have been around for 10, 20, 30 plus years, it is your opportunity to give the cheat codes to the young group coming up. So it's the responsibility of the, the sage, wise firefighters to give that information to the young folks. But more importantly, it's the responsibility of the young folks to listen to that. If you guys are out on the grinder or you guys are drilling, and a senior firefighter came up to you and said, hey, try pulling it this way or try manipulating it that way, you'd most likely listen, that's job specific. But what else is job specific and very unique to you guys is sleep, stress, nutrition, exercise, and all these other things too. So the, the older folks need to teach the younger folks and the younger folks need to listen to what those older folks have to say. Learn from their mistakes, learn from their successes, right? So we've talked about some variables to consider, but why train? 
What's the point? Who cares? Well, a couple of those reasons are to prepare for duty, to keep yourself and others safe, to avoid some of these things that we're looking at on the other side here, atrophy and hypertrophy. Uh, we want to acquire hypertrophy or we want to increase muscle size. We don't want to atrophy or decrease muscle size. So we're training to avoid atrophy, sarcopenia, osteoporosis, and other non-communicable diseases. These are, these are things that we can affect positively by diet and exercise. Last couple things here is everything's easier when you're stronger. What does that mean? Uh, I had a mentor uh, in the world of strength conditioning, and he said, Levi, everything's easier when you're stronger. And I just kind of heard it and was like, yeah, whatever. But as I started to peel that back and try to understand what that means, I've never done something and gone, wow, I was way too strong for that. It just doesn't happen, right? And this is more, this has become more and more evident outside of the gym for me. Uh, yes, things are easier in the gym when you're stronger, uh, but also in life. I live on maybe what some would consider a ranch, and I'm, I cut my own firewood every year, I have to move stones. Um, you know, I'm doing a lot of odd object lifting and, and tool manipulation. Uh, and so I notice when I'm not training well, I'm a little more sore. I'm not able to pick certain things up and it's a lot tougher to move objects. But when I'm training, it's way easier. So I never pick up a log or a stone and go, man, I wish I wasn't strong enough to do that. It's always the opposite. So everything's easier when you're stronger. But the question then is, how strong do you need to be? I don't know. You need to be strong enough. And that's going to be different again for the new hire, for the engineer, for the captain and the chief. And then as you go into retirement, do you need to be as strong as you were when you first entered the fire service when you retire? Maybe not. Maybe you want to be. And you can do those things. But just know that in general, everything is easier when you're stronger. But we need to get there in a smart way. And that's what we're going to be talking about when we go through the programming piece. Then lastly here is your training to make sure that you are enjoying your time in the service and that you're healthy while in the service as well as on your way out. You guys are in a job where the susceptibility to injury is much greater than someone that works a sedentary job. You guys are having to uh, operate heavy equipment. You guys are manipulating people in that equipment. And you're in some precarious situations. One of my favorite stories, and this kind of leads also into or, or goes back to everything's easier when you're stronger. I was giving a deadlift lecture years ago. And I was talking about how, you know, you need to train your posterior chain. You guys lift bodies off the ground. You guys, you know, manipulating heavy equipment. You need the grip strength. You need the hamstring, the glute strength, the back strength, all these things. And I thought I was Joe Cool. And there was a firefighter that was kind of sitting in the back doing one of these numbers like, eh. He was shaking his head. He was, he was agreeable, but he had his arms crossed. And, and uh, I go, hey, is everything okay? Am I saying something that, that doesn't make sense here? And he goes, no, no, this is great, but it's not real. And I kind of you know, I'm taken aback a little bit. I go, what do you mean? He's like, well, you're talking about picking up a bar that's perfectly round, that's exactly nine inches off the ground. That's not our reality, right? Uh, we're dealing with manipulating patients and, and all these different things that it's not a perfect setting. In fact, we just came back on a call from someone who passed out in the restroom. They were a bariatric patient, and I had one foot on top of the sink and one on the tub, and I'm lifting this guy up. And so the idea that, um, you know, that the training should be in a certain and specific way, there's ideal and there's realistic. So again, what I mean by that is in the gym, we should be performing these perfect reps. Uh, we should really be focusing on our technique because when we're out in the field, we're not able to do that. And so if we are training appropriately in the gym, then we're going to be able to enjoy our time in the service and post-service because we've kept ourselves as healthy as possible and did our best to avoid injury. Because there's things that you guys cannot avoid. You can't say, hey, can you move over a couple feet? I'm not really able to pick you up really well. So you guys need to utilize those quality reps in the gym to, again, prepare yourself for the unknown and unknowable. And because of that, everything is easier when you're stronger. All right? So uh, let's get into some training principles. All right. We're now transitioning from the, the why into the how. 
We know why we need to train, but how do we actually do it, okay? So some training principles. Consider these when building your program, regardless of your goal, okay? So again, a firefighter is gonna need something different than an engineer, captain, chief, and so on, and, and someone that's going into retirement. But there are common principles that will apply regardless. And we're not, this is not a kinesiology class, so we're not gonna go deep into any one of these, but these are important concepts to understand as you create your own programming or select programming from a third party. So uh, this is all, these, these principles are relevant for both resistance or strength training as well as cardiovascular training. So energy systems. We work through three. We have the ATP PCR, the glycolytic, and the oxidative. The ATP PCR is the one rep max. It's the 40 yard dash. It's kicking in the door to go and fight fire, okay? It's an immediate burst of energy. There's training that will specifically prepare you for those demands. Next, we have the glycolytic phase. This is kind of the in-between. This is our transition from the ATP PCR to the oxidative system where we have some repeated bouts, but it's not over a long duration. We're still able to maintain some strength and power, uh, but it's not as much as our one rep max, and it's not as much as a long steady state effort. So this would be maybe an eight to 12 reps, or this would be doing some sprint repeats or something like that, and that's what it would look like in the gym. Next, we have the oxidative system, okay? And this is, again, now our steady state. It's the exact opposite of our ATP PCR. This is a long duration, repeated bouts uh, of effort, okay? This would be like a five minutes of burpees, as much as you can, remember that movement that I hate, uh, or a long steady state jog, which I'm not a huge fan of either, but that's aside from the point. Next, we have the overload principle. This is the concept or idea of doing a little bit more today than you did yesterday. We talked about everything's easier when you're stronger. Well, how do you get stronger? It's by doing a little bit more today than you did yesterday. Again, that's very general, so I wanna be mindful that I'm not just saying, hey, keep doing more and more and more and more. There's gonna be fluctuations. Uh, there's gonna be peaks and valleys in that. We just don't want our peaks and valleys to be too large. What do I mean by that? Well, hey, let's come in day one. You've never trained. We're gonna max you out. <laughs> We're getting after it up here but you're not gonna be able to progress, and so you're gonna to have to drop down, essentially. So again, the goal is start somewhere conservative or something that you know you can handle with the concept in mind or the idea in mind that you are building over a long period of time, both in your strength journey as well as your conditioning journey. Next is the SED principle. This stands for specific adaptation to impose demands. If you wanna get stronger, you can't do super lightweight for a bunch of reps. Okay. Now, if you've never trained, you'll get a little bit stronger, but you're not going to do that over a long period of time. In order to get stronger, we, are, we need to lift in certain rep ranges with certain intensities and certain volumes, and we're going to go over what that looks like. So again, the said principle, if you come to me and you go, Levi, I want to get stronger, I'm not going to prescribe you, you know, five sets of 20 reps of just push-ups. We're going to need to bench press or squat or add some type of resistance. Similarly, if you tell me, hey, Levi, I wanna get faster, I'm not gonna send you on a one hour jog. Or if you're saying, I wanna improve my conditioning, I'm not gonna only prescribe sprints. Now, there's something to getting some extra volume when we wanna build strength for resistance training. And there's something to getting some extra volume in our running when we wanna improve our sprinting. This is getting a base level of fitness, base level of conditioning, base level of strength, or otherwise. But if we, true, if we have a specific goal, specific adaptation, if we're trying to drive that, we need to make sure that we are reflecting that in the way that we are training, the sets, reps, et cetera. Next, individuality. What works for me might not work for you. So when we, we need to be mindful of creating a group program that's for everyone. Again, whether there's physiological differences, which we all have, or differences in our position. The firefighter needs something different than the engineer, something different than the captain and the chief. Now, movement patterns can stay the same, and if you really want, you can do the same thing. Just know that it might need to be different to gain or achieve the goals set out. I have a buddy who he can lift weights for a week and all of a sudden he's back up to squatting 400 pounds, he's deadlifting 500 pounds, he's clean and jerking 300 pounds, and I've been lifting for, you know, a year straight and I'm still like, hey man, I'm just trying to catch up. So everyone's a little bit different. That said, we can go on a run and he's, you know, 
trudging behind me and can't keep up and I'm, hey, come on, man, hurry up. So it's just that everyone is a little bit different. So when you guys are creating these training programs, have a general idea to work within, but then be ready to make small changes depending on your goals and the needs of each individual. Last couple here, reversibility or detraining. If you don't use it, you lose it. Simple as that. You could train for six months. You're not going to keep that strength for the rest of your life. Okay. So we need to maintain some type of consistency. And we'll talk about some of those minimum expectations as we move forward. And then lastly, so uh, lastly is overtraining. And this is what I referred to earlier as needing to save some people from themselves. This is a demographic that's willing to run into a burning building. Oftentimes I'm having to try to peel things back rather than add things on because this, this profession self-selects for, again, people that are willing to run into burning buildings. So to think that you're not willing to train a little bit more or train a little bit harder is silly because you guys get after it, okay? But this is the, the principle of making sure that you're protecting yourself from yourself. When you get out and you have six, seven, eight calls after 10 p.m., is the next day the day to get your one rep max? Probably not. Is there gonna be a story someone's listening and go, hey man, I, I had 12 calls the night before and I squatted the heaviest I've ever squatted. That could be true. I'm not saying you're lying, but is that the best? Just because you can doesn't mean you should, okay? Let's go ahead and continue on here. So I alluded to some of the sets, reps, or what we would consider volume and intensity. We're gonna go through that a little bit here. So according to the ACSM, the American College of Sports Medicine, in order to maintain a level of strength or conditioning, which are two separate things but can be paired as they are, uh, just keeping that in mind for later, uh, a minimum of two days per week for weightlifting and or conditioning. And that can vary depending on the goal, but we need to be physically active in those two modalities at least twice a week. Uh, we then have different kind of parameters, paradigms, protocols, or training goals that we can work through. We have strength, power, hypertrophy, and endurance. And what exactly are each of those? So strength is brute strength. How much can I lift one time, more or less? Or what's the most amount of weight I can lift? Power is how fast can I lift the weight? Hypertrophy is adding a little bit of size. Hypertrophy, I almost think of as the hybrid. There's elements of strength and power in this protocol, but there's also elements of endurance, okay? And then lastly is endurance is how long you can go. This is higher volume, lower weight, all right? One thing to also consider as you see in the loads here on the far side is that the load will dictate the amount of reps. What do I mean by that? If I prescribe you something for 85%, but say to do it 20, 20 reps, you're probably not gonna be able to do that because the weight is too heavy. So the weight will always dictate the reps, okay? So in order to develop strength, we talked about the said principle, specific adaptation to imposed demands. The imposed demands here are specific loads and goal repetitions, or uh, rather repetitions. So to build strength, in general, you need to be lifting at or above 85% of your one rep max, and you shouldn't be able to do more than six reps because as we increase the amount of weight, we're gonna decrease the amount of reps just by proxy because it's too heavy to do. I'd love it if I could prescribe you 95% and you could do 10 reps, which is not gonna happen, okay? Uh, next for power, we have single and multiple efforts, but essentially we're working between 75 and 90% of a one rep max. If you don't have one RMs, that's fine. We're just trying to put a number to this. Uh, that said, I've also seen power being trained at 50%, 60%. And why is that? Very similar to the amount of reps, the amount of weight is also going to dictate the speed. Something that's lighter, we're going to be able to, in general, move it faster. Okay? So uh, in, as we think about this specifically, to give you some uh, numbers to look at, power is trained typically between 75 and 90%, and we're doing between one and five repetitions. Usually these aren't touch and go reps where it's, you know, you complete a clean and then you bring it back down and go right back up. Usually it's a clean pick from the bottom after I've done an exercise, reset, get everything organized, boom, and explode. The goal here is speed, not how fast I can get it done, but how quickly can I perform an individual movement. 
Then we have hypertrophy. This is 67 to 85%. And then we are, our goal rep range is six to 12 repetitions. I'm gonna come back to that. Moving on to muscular endurance, we're at 65% or less of our one rep max at 12 or more repetitions. Now for me, again, in general, I would train in the hypertrophy range, somewhere in there, okay, for a multitude of reasons. The low end of the load for hypertrophy is right at our muscular endurance. Similarly, the goal repetitions is also falls within that muscular endurance range. So we're getting a little bit of muscular endurance when we train in the hypertrophy paradigm. Similarly, at 85%, we're meeting the minimum load requirement for strength. And then also you see that the goal repetition is right in that range too. So depending on how I play and shift with these numbers and, and put them through these ranges, I can help you develop strength as well as endurance, okay? So it's kind of a hybrid between the two, which is why I would argue it's probably the best paradigm to look at. If you have a specific goal, you say, Levi, I wanna squat 500 pounds, or I wanna get stronger, whatever it is that you wanna do, that's fine. Uh, but if you were to say, hey, I just need to be generally fit for my job, for me personally, I'm putting you on a hypertrophy protocol. A lot of people traditionally think of this as a bodybuilding protocol, and here's the thing, none of you are getting that big. It's not possible, unless you are using some performance enhancers and you're dedicating your life to the world of bodybuilding. So don't worry about getting too big and all these other things. That's not really the case. And not many guys would be like, oh, I'm too jacked, you know? That's never really the case. But uh, anyways, so for me, hypertrophy is the ideal protocol to follow, okay? There's the most, I guess for me, it's because there's the most wiggle room and I can tailor it. It's easily upscaled to more endurance or downscaled to strength. And then lastly, something else to consider is the actual volume. So we've talked about the amount of weight that we should be lifting, the amount of repetitions, and then some set guidelines. How many times should I do six or less reps? For strength, it's anywhere between two and six. For power, three to five. Hypertrophy, three to six. And then muscular endurance, two to three, okay? Uh, this is according to Hath and Triplet in 2016. This is the Essentials of Strength Conditioning textbook. So for any of you kin nerds out there, this is the book that prepares you for the CSCS, the Certified Strength Conditioning Specialist Certification, uh, one of the gold standards in the strength conditioning world, okay? So these are, again, some general numbers. There's individuality. You may need to add a couple reps. You may need to decrease a couple reps, add a little bit of weight or take a little bit of weight off. But these are some general guidelines that you can begin following as you build out your program. So we have strength and conditioning. Some are gonna argue that you need to have strength and don't need to worry about your conditioning. Some are going to conversely say that you need conditioning and don't really need that much strength. For me, I think you need enough of both. And I don't know what that is for each individual and then also for each position, firefighter, chief, you know, and everything in between. Those demands are gonna be different. But in general, whether you are a uh, first year, a new hire, or you're at the chief level, we still need to be doing some type of resistance training from that previous slide and some type of conditioning. We have a couple different options here and these options will be dependent on what you want to do as well as what your position requires. So we have uh, steady state, we have VO2 max training, sprinting, and change of direction. So steady state is moderate to vigorous. Again, according to the ACSM, we need to accumulate approximately 150 minutes per week. As the intensity increases, the volume will decrease, much like our resistance training protocols. So if I'm doing kind of more moderate, then we should be up in that 150 minute range. If I'm doing vigorous, then it can drop down to the 70 or 80 minutes a week. And examples of that would be going on a 30 minute jog would be a slow, steady state, would be more moderate, whereas vigorous would be sprint repeats and we're training the oxidative system, okay? Next, we have repeated bouts, which again is that threshold training, VO2 max. Uh, these are repeated bouts with minimal rest. So it might be, hey, run 100 meters, uh, and then you have 30 seconds to recover, sprint 100 meters, 30 seconds to recover, sprint 100 meters. There's different time paradigms or, or uh, protocols that we can follow, but in general, it's gonna be repeated bouts. We are, 
this is, again, that kind of middle range, whereas a slow, steady state, we're going to keep our heart rate at 70%, 75%, or whatever that is during our jog, whereas something like sprinting, we're going to jack our heart rate up, and then we're going to bring it down. The VO2 max training is somewhere in between. We're going to elevate our heart rate past 70%, but we might, only, we might recover back down to 70% and then take off again and go. So this is kind of training that middle ground, which if I were to pick one and only one of these four, that's probably one of the ones that I would lean more to, the VO2 max training, because we're getting an uh, element of sprint and speed, but also the ability to repeat that over time. Very similar to the fire service, okay? Last couple here is sprinting. So this is going as fast as possible. Whereas before we had minimal rest, now because the goal is speed, we're taking maximal rest. If I want you to run as fast as possible, I can't expect you to do it over and over and over. And if I do, then I need you to take enough time off to be able to recover from the max effort that you're doing. Very similar in the weight room. If I prescribe a one rep max training day, I'm not gonna make you do that over and over and over. It's implied that you're giving the maximum amount of effort. If you look at some of Charlie Francis's work as sprint coach, an Olympic sprint coach, uh, he has some pro uh, protocols to follow within. I believe it's 94% of your fastest time for that day. If you drop below, or it takes you, if your time increases to where it's more than a 94% deviation from your fastest run, shut it down. Or rest a little bit longer and see if you can increase the speed again, and if not, shut it down. The training is over for that day, but that doesn't mean you do nothing else. Maybe you do some technique work, or maybe that's when after you've sprinted, you're going in and doing your resistance training, okay? So keep that in mind as well. Lastly, change of direction, movement through space. You guys are picking things up, twisting, turning, pulling, pushing, doing all these different things, and so we can train our trunk, we can train our coordination, and improve our conditioning by doing that in the training. What does that look like? It could be a 5-10-5 drill where we're starting in the middle of two cones, run five yards to one side, touch, run 10 yards to the other side, touch, run through the middle. It could be uh, taking a heavy sandbag and walking it up and back, forward and backward, and really being aware of our surroundings and how to manipulate our body through space. That's the goal here with the change of direction. So we need to have some type of resistance and some type of conditioning or some type of strength and some type of conditioning. Some considerations, we're, we're wrapping it up here. We're trying to land this plane, okay? Before we build a program, we have some considerations here. One other thing, as we kind of look back here, when you are on the back half of your career, if, you're, you, know, if you don't wanna go run a marathon or do a triathlon or something like that, you don't have a specific training goal, if we look at the resistance training exercise, again, hypertrophy would be ideal for you. General health, you're strong enough, you have some muscular endurance. Similarly, with the conditioning piece, maybe it becomes more steady state and VO2 max, but I would also encourage a little bit of change of direction. That said, uh, for sure doing some type of steady state and some type of VO2 max training. And the intensity can vary. It doesn't need to be, hey, I'm preparing for the Ironman. That's not what it has to, has to come to. Uh, but we do need to be in shape enough, whether we are still in the service or out of the service, because being in shape out of service is to prevent some of these non-communicable diseases, atrophying, and the other things that we talked about a little bit earlier. Considerations for building a strength and conditioning program. Resistance training, we have bilateral and unilateral movement. Examples of this would be a back squat, bilateral, I'm using two legs. Unilateral would be a step up or a lunge, okay, where I have one limb is dominant. Uh, similarly, I can barbell bench press or I could dumbbell bench press a single dumbbell at a time. That would be unilateral, the unilateral version. Multiple planes of motion. We are dynamic people. We can move forward and back, side to side, and we can twist. So we need, our training needs to reflect that. Firefighting does not only take place in the sagittal plane, which is flexion and extension, flexion and extension. Firefighting is very dynamic, so our training again should reflect that. Most programs that I see are sagittal plane dominant. There's no frontal plane movement side to side, and there's no twisting involved, which we should include in the training. Now, are we gonna do a one rep max uh, you know, cable chop? No, of course not. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do any type of twisting, either in our warm-ups, our movement prep, in the training itself, or as a cool down, okay? 
Next is compound versus single joint. Compound is multiple joints. So a bench press would be working the shoulder and the elbow. We're working, this is a compound exercise. Or we can do a single joint where we do a chest fly or we do a tricep extension. So we can train, essentially the compound movements would be best bang for our buck. And then the single joint movements are kind of highlighting maybe some potential areas that we want to improve or the, again, that are, that are gaps in our training. I mean, everyone wants to make their sleeves a little bit tighter in their shirt. So we probably can't get away with just compound exercises to do that. We might need some uh, single joint exercises to focus on specific muscle groups. Similarly, we can look at this from an injury prevention, not just an aesthetics component, where if you want to strengthen the surrounding musculature, you may do a compound exercise and you can superset it or follow it up with a single joint exercise to make sure that you are strengthening the surrounding musculature of a specific joint. Lastly, on the resistance training side is quality versus quantity. I can give you these numbers. All right, we're working hypertrophy. So I'm going to have you do 75%, three sets of 10 reps. I can have you do that, but if you're starting to break at rep eight, stop, rack it up. Live to fight another day, okay? Maybe you got, call volume was crazy and you're just feeling slow and, and you're struggling. Or maybe you're new to weight training or new to the movement and you just don't move well within that. It's okay to not complete the specific set, rep, and intensity, especially at the expense of making sure that you are moving with quality rather than quality or quantity rather alone, okay? Now, we need to get our quantities to make sure that we're finding ourselves in those rep ranges, but not at the expense, again, of quality. Some considerations for the conditioning piece, speed versus endurance. If you want to get faster, you have to run fast. If you would like to expand your capacity, you need to be able to sacrifice that, run a little bit slower, but over a longer duration and maintain that. Uh, also, including some change of direction as well as resisted and non-resisted. So this would be like a sled push or a parachute sprint or whatever. Um, most people aren't going to have those tools, but if you have those tools available, certainly explore those and have some fun. Okay. So program design parameters. Keep in mind, you've just listened to me for, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes. And it's taken me this long to let you know that I am not the end all when it comes to this, okay? Every program will work to some degree for some period of time. But the goal is, or what you should be doing as you evaluate the efficacy of a program is, are you getting the results that you're looking for? Are these sustainable? And am I enjoying the program? Because we want to do this more than just a crazy squat cycle or some intense conditioning protocol or whatever. We want to make sure that we're able to do these things over a long period of time. So again, I'm not the end all when it comes to this, but this is a suggestion for making sure that we're working through multiple planes, uh, that we are uh, utilizing movement patterns that are beneficial for the new recruit all the way to retirement. Okay. So uh, we have to take into consideration a tour of training. So what you see here is about uh, seven movements or, or, or seven parameters to, to lift within. If you're on something like a 4896, maybe you do half on one day and half on the next, okay? You might do, and we'll get into that in a second, but I guess it's just a, a, to let you know that your shift may affect how much of this you do at one time. So a 4896 might do half. Someone on a fours and sixes schedule where you're every other day, you might do all of this in one training day, okay? And so we'll, we'll kind of, Take that into consideration as we do that. We have a primary exercise, and then we also have a modification. The primary exercise is ideal. This will help prepare you best as possible for your profession, but the modification is maybe you're injured, maybe you don't feel good, maybe it's, again, a crazy night of, of calls, or maybe your, your title, your position, doesn't require you to do the same amount of things, but you understand the value of movement. I've sold you on the importance of training. And so you don't have to get after it and go be Mr. Olympia, but we do need to do some type of training as we discussed earlier, okay? So I have here six different exercises. I have a lower body compound push, a lower body compound pull, a vertical push, a vertical pull, uh, a horizontal push, and a horizontal pull. Let me give you some examples of what that looks like. A lower body compound push 
in general would be something that's more quad dominant. And a lot of this is gonna be dependent on your mechanics, but I think most people would agree that something like a, you know, a, a squat, a front squat, let's say, which was even more clear. Something like a front squat is gonna be a little bit more quad dominant than posterior dominant. Now, our bodies work in a system. So our quadriceps are extending the knee, our glutes and hamstrings are extending the hips. So yes, we're working anterior and posterior muscle groups, but in general, because of our posture, it will be a little bit more quad dominant. Similarly, in our lower body compound pull, this would be posterior dominant, although in the deadlift, our uh, quads are still extending the knee because of where the weight is and our mechanics and setup and all these things, it's gonna be more posterior dominant in the hamstrings, glutes, and our back, okay? Understanding again that all of these are working all the time, it's just that there may be more of a demand on one over the other depending on the movement that we select and, and our mechanics for that. So, uh, including a lower body push and a lower body pull. And notice I'm saying specifically a compound exercise. So it shouldn't be a leg extension for our lower body push, or it shouldn't be a hamstring curl for a lower body pull. It's training those muscles, but that is a single joint exercise rather than compound using multiple joints. So let's uh, pause for a second here. 4896 versus fours and sixes. When you look at this, if you're a 4896 and you're gonna train on Monday and then Tuesday, Maybe you do your lower body push, your upper body vertical push, and your upper body horizontal push on day one. Second day on your tour, you do a lower body pull, upper body vertical pull, and an upper body horizontal pull. So that's how you can split these up. Also, if you find that it is very difficult to uh, get this in with the time available at your department, that's okay too. Uh, so make sure that you guys are uh, accommodating that or, or considering that. You don't have to do all of this all at once. If you are a station that's super busy and you only have time to do a couple of those things, I would recommend for sure a lower body compound exercise and some type of upper body compound exercise. All right. So we got our lower push and our lower pull. Next we have a vertical push and a vertical pull. A vertical push would be something like a barbell overhead press, dumbbell press, something that's being pressed up during the concentric or difficult part of the exercise. And then we have a vertical pull. This would be a lat pull down, a pull up, and also understand that we can vary these to the end of time. So most people think of a pull up, okay? Grip out here, a prone grip. You can do a close grip prone, supine, supine wide. You can do a mixed grip. You have bars that have all different types of angles. We've now already discussed five different types of pull-ups. You can use towels, you can use ropes, you can use uh, a tennis ball on top of the bar and really challenge your grip. There's many different ways that we can do some of these exercises. And again, that's where the primary exercise and the modification comes into play. So for example, we talked about a back squat and a deadlift earlier and a pull-up. So a modification to those where the movement pattern is the same, instead of a back squat, maybe it's a goblet squat, okay? We're gonna be a lot more cognizant of the amount of weight. We're simply not gonna be able to find a kettlebell that's uh, you know, a 300 pound kettlebell, but maybe you don't need to squat 300 pounds, so you can do a goblet squat instead. And you notice that it feels better on your back because it forces you to stay in a more vertical posture. Great, use that, okay? Um, similarly with the deadlift, hey, I'm that guy, like I, my back's injured, I don't wanna get injured more, I won't do a deadlift. Okay, we still need to train the posterior chain and we can do that in safe ways. Let's do a glute bridge, okay? We're still training the hamstrings and the glutes, which are the muscles that extend the hips. A pull up, hey, I can't do one pull up, Levi. No worries, grab a band and let's do some banded pull downs until we're able to develop enough strength for a pull up. Perhaps we'll do some eccentrics. We'll get to the top of the bar and we're gonna lower ourselves as slowly as we can to develop strength for the pull-up, okay? So there's primary, there's ideal, and then maybe for some realistic, which would be our modification, okay? So we got our vertical push, which again is maybe a barbell press, dumbbell press, something where the concentric or difficult phase is going overhead. And then the converse to that would be something where the difficult phase is, is pulling ourselves up or pulling a weight to us during the concentric phase. Lastly, we have the upper horizontal push and the upper horizontal pull. Be thinking to yourself, well, what does that mean? Horizontal is in this plane here, out in front of us, whether we're laying down or standing up or whatever. Uh, but our horizontal push would be a push-up. 
the hard part of the lift is the, the concentric phases when we are extending at the elbow and flexing at the shoulder, okay? A bench press, a med ball chest pass, something like that where the concentric phase is elbow extension and shoulder flexion or horizontal adduction. Not trying to bore you guys with all the terms. But basically, that we are pressing out in front of us. The upper body horizontal pull is the converse. When we're pulling ourselves to something, this could be a bent over row, this could be a supine body row with rings, a multitude of things, a single arm bent row, so on and so forth, okay? So what this might look like, or, or before we get down there, sorry, let's go to a, a conditioning piece. In general, there should be some type of conditioning. If you don't have time though, for me, and this is where some of you might, you know, jump off from here, and I understand that. I'm more than happy to have this discussion. With conditioning, if I were to say, okay, you got 20 minutes, do you do the strength or the conditioning piece? For me, in general, I would argue that we should be doing the strength piece because our heart rate is gonna get up and we're gonna get a similar effect where there is a cardiovascular demand. Whereas if we run, we are simply not going to get any type of strength component from that. Okay, so the amount of strength and cardiovascular training that we can get from weightlifting is more than running alone, okay? Now, if the only way for you to be physically active is by running, then go run, that's fine. You're physically active, you're getting a couple days a weekend, I get it. But I would encourage you to make sure that you're finding time for the resistance training piece because it shouldn't be just conditioning, just like it shouldn't be just weightlifting. It needs to be a version of both. And you can get this in a bunch of different ways. Conditioning, maybe you're, you're, you're into jujitsu, or maybe you're into some other physical activity, like playing basketball, pickleball, whatever the new game is. My kids play gaga ball. I don't know if this is gonna date this video, but whatever type of physical activity you like, do that as your conditioning. It doesn't have to be just plug the headphones in and take off and run. And if you were to prioritize that, again, for me, I'm speaking for myself here, strength or resistance training, I should say more specifically, would be what I use my time for, okay? But in that conditioning, it should be some type of sprinting, change of direction, maybe some type of agility exercise, or even the lactate threshold and steady state training. Steady state training. Remember the lactate threshold is that VO2 max that we talked about a little bit earlier, and the steady state is the plug in the headphones and go for a half hour, hour, or whatever you do. So here is a sample program. There are many different ways to do this. Um, if the goal is to develop absolute strength, we're looking at more bilateral exercises. The unilateral exercises are gonna help with stability and they will uh, you know, aid in strength development, but we can't overload a lunge the same that we can overload a back squat, okay? We're just not gonna be able to lunge as much weight as we could if we load it up on both legs. So if we're looking to develop strength, back squat, um, deadlifts are great pulling, lower body pulling exercises, strip press we talked about, pull up we talked about, bench press, Meadows rows, this is essentially a single arm, uh, single arm row using a barbell instead of a dumbbell. And then a change of direction, a med ball throw and retrieve. This is something that's a little bit more fun. Again, it doesn't have to be just, you know, throw the headphones in and go. You can take a med ball and you can chest pass it as far as you can. We're working a horizontal push. As soon as it lands, sprint to it, pick it up, and do maybe five med ball slams. Or as soon as you pick it up, then you have to heave it behind you and throw it as far as you can. Once it lands, turn and sprint. This is change of direction. We're getting some conditioning into this piece too. Um, so you can be as creative as you want in all of this stuff. Now, something to caution against. Don't get too exotic with the movement selection, the sets, the reps, and the intensities. Again, it doesn't take much. We just need to do a little bit more today than we did yesterday. So start conservative, start easy, uh, knowing that you're gonna be building this up over time, okay? If you're looking for specifics with any of this, again, I know I'm giving you kind of a general overview. If we were live, we'd actually be building this together, but I'm more than happy to come out, clarify any of the information in here. If you'd like to dispute this, I'm open to hearing from you guys. Again, I'm using information that I've acquired from over the years from firefighters, but if there's something new, that's what I need to know too to best prepare you guys to create safe and effective programs. So. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to hearing from y'all with any questions.